We are both very excited and grateful to uh, have this opportunity to share some of our recent work, and in particular, how we leverage Cilium in order to uh, secure uh, the network connectivity of our workloads amongst multiple Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so Amos and I, we both work at Datadog, uh, and we are working a team in charge of uh, the Kubernetes network platform there. And in case you don't know about us, uh, we are a software as a service uh, observability, of, uh, observability platform, and we help our customers uh, to uh, get better visibility into their applications and infrastructure. To give you a bit of uh, scale, a sense of scale, uh, as of now, we handle about, uh, well, over 100 trillion events a day, data points, if you will. And in order to manage this kind of traffic, uh, we uh, do so over a multi-cloud Kubernetes-based environment. And uh, of course, to get our network packets flowing smoothly between our hundreds of thousands of pods amongst hundreds of clusters, uh, we decided to use Cilium to do so. So as an agenda for today, uh, we're going to start with some refresher about what, uh, why network policies are important and we, why we need them in the first place, uh, and how they are being implemented in, uh, within Cilium, uh, most importantly. Uh, we'll then iterate over what solutions are available uh, when we uh, look to make them work amongst uh, multiple clusters. And finally, we'll uh, give you a bit of insights around what we felt was interesting to share about uh, and keep in mind when operating such a setup. So, to illustrate our thoughts, uh, we'd like to start with a, a simple web application design that is composed of a few components. We have a front end, a back end, a database, a potential third party service that uh, we might need uh, to access. And security being a priority, controlling what these components uh, can communicate with is paramount in order to uh, reduce the potential attack surface of our application. And whether the solution is being deployed on premises or over a public cloud provider, uh, there is most likely existing primitives that uh, we can leverage in order to secure uh, such, uh, the communication of those components. So for instance, if that application were to run on AWS uh, natively, uh, we could leverage security groups or IAM policies in order to explicitly authorize uh, the connectivity permissions uh, between them all. However, as soon as we add Kubernetes into the mix, it becomes much trickier because our components will from now on be containerized, running as pods, uh, potentially over the same instances that we used to have at first. But ultimately, what we'll want to do is to make most of uh, the resources that we are paying for. And that can translate potentially by using larger instance types uh, and bin pack some components that do not necessarily belong to the same application and therefore not supposed to talk to their neighbors or all the pods uh, across uh, the cluster. And if we look at the recommendation that AWS make uh, around the operation of an EKS cluster, uh, although this is valid for most providers, uh, well, they basically advise us to allow all traffic between each node of the cluster. But how can we keep communication uh, secure in such case then? Well, clearly what uh, they are encouraging us to do here is to think of using higher up primitives in order to do so. And this is what network policies are here for. Well, they're here to uh, enable us with finer grained uh, control mechanisms that are based upon Kubernetes uh, primitives, uh, such as resource types, labels, or any sort of metadata that uh, we can relate to through Kubernetes abstractions. And they enable us so by letting us reference uh, our pods with the actual representation within a Kubernetes cluster, not through the actual network implementation details, uh, such as the IP addresses or uh, the subnets they are uh, part of. But most importantly, when we define a network policy, what we do is that we determine which pod uh, this policy applies to, what can connect to these pods, and what those pods can connect to. And that's the real key here, as using such abstractions gives us much more control on what we want to target, as well as enables us with, with much more tightly coupled uh, configuration capabilities. So the first thing we'd like to mention uh, is something that we, which we had started with uh, earlier on. And we are now migrating towards. Uh, and that would be starting from a deny by default kind of approach, where we will have our users explicitly define the accesses that their components need. Uh, and that's because it's always much easier to ask, well, to give permission to someone rather than reclaiming it back much later on. And I won't get into details into uh, how to achieve so, but what I want to talk to you about now, well, uh, but know that there are many ways to achieve, uh, to achieve it. Uh, and what I want to talk to you about now is how all of this is being implemented within Cilium. Uh, 
Well, when we use network policies with Cilium, there are two very important concepts which are essential to understand how those policies are being enforced. And those two concepts are identities and endpoints. So an identity in, in Cilium is basically a unique identifier uh, that is assigned within the cluster. It's derived from a set of labels. But in short, what they do is that they, they allow us to represent a set of pods which are fairly similar. They can be part of the same deployment of, or replica set, for instance. And in Kubernetes, as pods uh, may come and go quite easily, so will their IP addresses that are associated to them. And having such abstractions makes it much easier to scale out uh, the enforcement of uh, our policies. And I will dig into that a bit later on. Endpoints on their own, they are here to keep track of the necessary mappings between the Kubernetes abstractions and the actual network implementation details of the pods. So if you briefly look into how they are composed, we can notice that first there is a one-to-one -one mapping with a pod that the endpoint is uh, referencing. They also have their own unique ID within the cluster, and uh, they have also, uh, interestingly, a one-to-one -one mapping with an existing identity that uh, matches the labels of the pods that is being referenced. And finally, what we can see as well is that they contain the IP address of the pod and the node that the pod is running uh, on. Now, if we look at the bigger picture here, to enforce network policies, each Cilium agent has to keep track of all of the endpoints and identities that are part of the cluster. However, as you can see there as well, there is no peer-to-peer -peer sharing of that information. Instead, they all rely onto a centralized source of truth, and that source of truth can be implemented in a couple of ways, either through the cluster's API server, uh, leveraging some custom resource definitions, which is now the default method, or they can leverage a dedicated key value store, such as an ETCD cluster, for example. And why is there two methods, though? Well, there is a bit of history behind it, and Emos will uh, cover that shortly, but mostly it has to do with the way they scale. So let's imagine we are using the default methods. We have each identity and endpoint being stored as an object through a custom resource definition on the cluster, Kubernetes Clusters API server. And let's say this is a, a fairly large cluster composed of about 5,000 nodes. Well, in that case, let's say we also have someone which is attempting to scale out a deployment and add up uh, an additional 100 pods. Well, in such case, this simple upscale, apparently reasonable at first sight, will actually result in triggering half a million watch updates from the API servers, as each Cilium agent will need to know about these new endpoints which are being created. And as you can imagine, having such uh, activity can rapidly become an issue if we can't have an efficient way to manage that. But thankfully, though, there are various ways uh, to reduce this pressure. For example, to name one, uh, we can use Cilium endpoint slices since uh, v1.11. Uh, and that can greatly reduce uh, the amount of updates that are required by batching them up together. At Datadog, we currently have both uh, solutions. So most of our clusters, which are fairly small in size, uh, under 1,000 nodes, uh, are running under the default approach using the, the CRD-based uh, approach. And our bigger ones have, uh, have dedicated ETCD clusters associated with them. And as our node count can evolve over time, we can now easily switch from one to another, thanks to uh, great contributions that our colleague uh, Anton made recently, which allows us to uh, write to both uh, modes uh, in parallel, which makes the migration path uh, very straightforward from now on. Now, if you'd like to get further information uh, about how those storage modes uh, compare to each other, there is also a great tool that, that Hemos and uh, Marcel did uh, during last uh, KubeCon, uh, where they dug into, uh, into it. So, ultimately, though, there is only a finite number of nodes and pods that a Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster uh, is able to um, support. So when your applications are about to outgrow those numbers, well, it might be a good time to think uh, beyond and where a multi-cluster setup might become um, uh, paramount in order to keep your business gr uh, growing. But what about our network policies, though? Because as we can think of our apps can now be running over different clusters, so would their respective endpoints and identities. So then we need to think about our options. First, we could assume, assuming that our infrastructure provider can handle the underlying network uh, connectivity and routing between our nodes and pods across cluster, we could 
consider going back to some simpler, good old networking uh, practices such as layer three filtering. However, by doing so, that would also mean trading off those uh, finer grain control that uh, everyone is now used to. So that's not necessarily uh, an interesting uh, fit. In a similar vein, uh, we could also think of leveraging policies that can interact directly with the underlying uh, uh, provider. But this is also not necessarily something that is available for all providers. But most importantly, that would also mean that uh, our policies are not so provider agnostic anymore, which is not ideal. Otherwise, if our endpoints are uh, resolvable globally onto our network, potentially we could think of using DNS policies to manage uh, permissions. This would uh, work potentially nicely for egress. Unfortunately, for ingress, the support is still quite limited, so uh, that would still remain uh, tricky, though. Another idea that came to our mind when we looked into it uh, was the service mesh kind of approach. So where we could place some gateways on both edges of our clusters that would uh, handle the ingress and the egress traffic going from one cluster to another. But at Datadog, though, uh, our pods are already globally uh, routed across clusters and cloud providers using the uh, native primitives that uh, we obtain from them. And so adding gateways in the sole purpose of enforcing security boundaries uh, did, not seem like the, did not seem like the most pertinent option at the time. First, uh, independently of which solution we would pick, we would have to ask our users to change their existing policies, which would lead to frustration and also would require some coordination in order to roll that out. And secondly, by being so loosely coupled, those new approaches would make our day two operations much trickier to support. So the dream for us there would actually to be able to let our users migrate their workloads from one cluster to the other without necessarily having to change a single line of their existing policies. And this is why we felt that investing into cluster mesh seemed to be like the most pertinent option for us. And I will not let Emos uh, continue explaining you why. All right. Uh, thanks, Maxim. So as we just saw, Cilium has a bunch of options that allow you to cross that cluster boundary today. But all of those features we saw until now are built with very specific requirements in mind, right? But if you wanted the Kubernetes native network policy experience that you're already used to within a single cluster and expand that between multiple clusters, Cluster Mesh is the solution to go. So actually, a quick show of hands. How many of you are already using a variant of Cluster Mesh? OK, good. Not, not too many, so we'll start with some basics. So, um, so Cluster Mesh. At the crux of it, all Cluster Mesh is doing is taking some of the state that is required for Cilium to enforce a network policy from one cluster and moving that to other clusters that are part of the mesh, right? So that's just the crux of Cluster Mesh. And there are multiple ways of doing it, right? And we primarily at Datadog focus on uniform network policy enforcement, but there are other features like global service load balancing you can take advantage of. So if you try to get started with Cluster Mesh today, there are a lot of options. And sometimes it can get really confusing on which mode to pick. And, but there are actually really good reasons on why there are that many different cluster mesh modes. So to understand some of those design decisions, we need to take a little look at the evolution of cluster mesh. So an interesting tidbit here is that all the way back to Cilium 1.2, which was released around August 2018, Cilium actually had support for cluster mesh. And in this mode, uh, at this point in time, Kubernetes actually did not have custom resource definition, right? So all of the data that is required by Cilium is stored in a dedicated uh, KV store, either with HCD or console. And um, uh, almost a year after that, Cilium introduced a mode called CRD mode, where you can store the identity and endpoint information within Kubernetes itself with CRDs. This is almost a month before Kubernetes stabilized CRDs. And starting around uh, Cilium 1.9 and 1.10, we started seeing a new component called Cluster Mesh API Server that was basically introduced to take the original Cluster Mesh, which was built to work with the KV Store mode, and make that uh, and support CID mode as well, right? And fast forward to 2023 with Cilium 1.14, we started another mode called KV Store Mesh mode, which is today the most scalable of all of these options, right? And starting from 116, this is now the default if you try to install Cluster Mesh. Uh, 
So if we go back to the original cluster mesh uh, architecture, how it worked is every Cilium agent within your cluster connected to not just your local HCD, but also to all the remote HCDs that are part of the mesh. So what this really means from a single HCD perspective is if a single endpoint is updated, HCD needs to push out that watch update, not just to every single Cilium agent within the cluster, but to every other Cilium agent in the rest of the cluster mesh, right? And this can very quickly introduce a lot of load on HCD. And if you want to quantify it, if you have M clusters in the mesh and N agents per cluster, it's M cross N updates that HCD needs to push out for every single endpoint update, and that's a lot. And if you look at the previous architecture, it did not really work with CID mode because, uh, because Cilium started with the KV stored mode. And in order to support cluster mesh, we have this new component called cluster mesh API server, which is primarily made up of two components. So there's one component that uh, call, I'll call it K8S sync here, but it's called API server in the Helm chart. So all it does is it connects to your Kubernetes control plane, reads all of that endpoint and identity information, and writes that to a local HCD that's part of the cluster mesh API server pod. Right? And after this, it's very similar to the original cluster mesh uh, architecture, and the scalability characteristics are pretty much the same. Right? You're still having to push out the M cross N updates on every endpoint update. Right? So in eBPF Summit 2022, there was a great talk by Arthur from ctrip.com, where he rightly pointed out that what if we had a controller that connected to remote HCDs, discovered all of that data, and made it available to me locally, so that all my local agents can discover uh, information from that. And fast forward to Cilium 114, uh, there was a new mode introduced called KV Store Mesh that basically implemented this architecture. And in this architecture, you see a new component called KV Store Mesh within the Cluster Mesh API server. So originally, we only had two components. There was a K8 async component and a local HCD. But now we have a new component called KV Store Mesh that's connecting to remote HCD clusters reading that information, and making it available to your local HCD, right? So with this architecture, you went from an M cross N updates to M plus N updates, right? Because instead of having all of the remote agents connecting to your HCD, you only have one connection per remote cluster, right? So this is a lot better now. And if you want to know more about like the exact differences between both of these modes and to get some metrics on how this actually impacts the endpoint propagation latency, there's a good talk by Ryan on uh, CiliumCon Chicago. I highly recommend watching it. All right, so if we go back to the KV store mesh algorithm and, oh, sorry, architecture, and take a closer look at it, this one looks like it's designed only to work with CRD mode, right? So you see a dedicated, uh, you see a co-located HCD pod container, but you don't see the dedicated HCD in KV store mode. But at Datadog, we've been running two variants of Cilium. You can either run it in CID mode or with dedicated HCD, and all of our large clusters run with dedicated HCD mode. So we really wanted to mesh some of our large clusters together, especially in environments where we have default deny, because you have no way to cross that cluster boundary if you don't have cluster mesh. So we were quite puzzled by the fact that this did not support KV store mode, right? So we created a test pod and started looking at the actual data that that is written to HCD, and compared the format uh, between the data format that is present in the local HCD cluster in KV store mode, and compared that against the data that Cluster Mesh API server writes to its local HCD container. And turns out, thanks to Cilium's architecture, they're exactly the same, right? So what that means is maybe we can point this Cluster Mesh API server container uh, pod and point that to our persistent HCD cluster, and maybe everything would work out of the box. And internally, we even started calling this KV, KV mesh mode, but we're open to suggestions on other names. So uh, to summarize this, we're trying to go from a cluster mesh API server, which had three containers, and get rid of the K8S sync component, get rid of the local HCD, and connect it to the dedicated HCD cluster, right? And when we tried that out, it actually surprisingly worked really well, except for like one small uh, issue, where, um, so every time, a given cluster needs to discover information about remote clusters. Things like uh, cluster ID or cluster name, all of that data is present in a, against a given key, and that data needs to be replicated to other clusters in order to discover that information. And this was maintained by the API server component, which we were getting rid of, 
So we had to move that uh, key, uh, key management to the CLM operator. And once we backported that, uh, we were able to run out of the box. And if you're trying to use this, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to deploy this using the upstream help chart, you'll likely run into some validation issues and it will not work out of the box because it's not designed to be run this way. But internally at Datadog, we run with our custom Helm chart, so we're able to make this work. And this was the original KV store mesh uh, architecture and we were able to simplify that to something that looks like this. And at this point, we were really comfortable with uh, being able to scale our total uh, mesh size because we have a dedicated HCD cluster we could play with. And if you want to scale up our uh, mesh size, we can simply upscale our HCD and we will be able to handle the additional load. So to summarize, it really comes down to what kind of identity allocation mode you're using. If you're using CRD, you have two options. If you're doing dedicated HCD, you also have two options. So over the course of, course of last six months, we've been migrating and meshing together some of our large clusters, and we've learned some lessons uh, while doing so. So if you're trying to do this with large clusters, I highly recommend trying to get a little familiar with what is the data that is actually being replicated between the clusters. And you need to also be cognizant of how fast are you shuffling that information, right? Because too much endpoint churn in one cluster, too much identity churn in one cluster can impact your other clusters, right? So you don't want that to happen. And what if my cluster mesh API server dies? Will I lose my cross-cluster connectivity soon after the cluster mesh API server dies? So luckily for the last problem from Cilium 116, we have a high availability mode for cluster mesh API server so you can run uh, another replica, and if you lose one of the nodes, the other replica should pick up immediately. And one of the key difference I want to highlight, especially if you're going from a single cluster to multi-cluster mesh, is the way your stale uh, keys are being garbage collected. So in a single cluster mode, the Cilium operator actually garbage collects stale keys, but when you mesh together multiple clusters, garbage collection can take a lot of time. So instead of doing garbage collection with the operator, Cilium relies on leases and TTLs. So every key that is added from remote uh, clusters has a corresponding lease attached to it, and it has a corresponding TTL attached to it. So what this means is the maximum amount of time your cluster mesh API server can go down is equal to the value of the TTL. So the default currently is 15 minutes. So if you lose the cluster mesh API server for 15 minutes, you'll lose the cross-cluster connectivity. So luckily for that part, we have a flag called uh, KV Store Lease TTL. It was marked as hidden historic for historical reasons. It was originally introduced to only work with CI, but I find it, uh, we find it really handy to actually tune that. So if you're okay with taking on a slightly extra load on the number of keys in your HCD cluster, we recommend that be bumped. And you can also play with the KV Store QPS settings, both for the bootstrap and regular uh, QPS so that you can actually control when there's a lot of identity or endpoint churn in remote clusters, you are capping that with the QPS settings. And originally we mentioned that we wanted workloads to move between uh, clusters, but if you have existing clusters and you're meshing them together and you have the network policies that are already configured, your CNPs might be considering them as world identities, and now they're going to become known identities. So your CNPs need to factor that in as well. And here's a snapshot of one of our dashboard that we use to monitor the entire cluster mesh. But some of the interesting metrics that are really useful are HCD MVCC lease expiration metrics. So if you see a lot of keys that are expiring, uh, that's something you need to keep an eye on. And Cilium also has some native connectivity metrics between clusters. So if you lose connectivity from one cluster to the other, we highly recommend like adding some alerts on this. And finally, you can also monitor the QPS settings so that you can be really sure if the QPS is working out well for you. And if you do get alerted, inevitably, there are also some on-demand commands that you can run called KV Store Debug Troubleshoot that will on-demand try to establish connections to remote HCD. And if you have some certificates expiring or things like that, you'll actually be able to see them here. And to summarize everything, um, and there's some future work that we think would be helpful for the entire KV Store Mesh ecosystem. 
So uh, the first point is that, as we discussed, there's a lot of data that's being replicated between clusters, right? So depending on the number of features that you're actually using in your production environments, all of the data that is being replicated between these clusters might not actually be necessary, right? So we can make Cilium smarter to replicate only that information that is really important for you. And the second point is uh, folks from Google are working on this concept called operator-managed Cilium identities, where we are trying to update Cilium to create identities only if a network policy actually uses it. So we can extend a similar concept to uh, KV Store Mesh as well, so that we export identities that are only relevant for your uh, policy enforcement. So hopefully this, uh, this disambiguated all the different cluster mesh modes that are available, and you have some good insights on how you could tune your uh, cluster mesh system. And that's pretty much what we had. And both Maxim and me are available on Twitter or CDM Slack. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to SIG Scalability or SIG Cluster Mesh. Thank you.